Hi everyone, this is Zach Limko with Fermentation Education here in the next part of our video series on Sour Beer Brewing, A Walk on the Wild Side. So a little bit about me. I'm Zach Zimko. I've been a home brewer for over four years. I'm currently a certified server through the Cicerone program. I am currently employed as a home brewing and wine making instructor. I have my Bachelor of Science from the University of Delaware, graduating in 2012, and in 2016 I'll be graduating as a Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine. So today we'll be talking about sour beer styles, and my goal for today is to give you a very solid understanding of the different styles that are available for you to brew and consume as a drinker. So a couple of the styles that we're going to be talking about today, we have Lambic, Goose, Flanders Red, Eau de Brune, Goza, Berliner Weiss, American Wild Ales, and other rare and historic sours. Before I begin, I just want to share a couple words of caution. The first is that Belgians are notorious for not caring about or adhering to any real distinct styles. It's sort of in their nature to not pay too much attention to specific style guidelines and focus more on the overall quality of the beer and instead of labeling it, just enjoy it for what it is. So don't worry too much about fitting something into a distinct style. Second thing is not to get hung up on the details. Um, use these suggested ranges as real guidelines rather than actual hard and fast rules. It's going to save you a bit of headache and it's going to allow you to enjoy your brew day and your drinking and fermentation a little bit more if you're not too firmly set on those details. The next thing is that really sour beers are living things and their styles and tastes may change over time. And this is both from a cultural perspective in that sour beers are constantly evolving in how we perceive them and even the new American frontier of sour beers is changing the whole way we look at sours. And the sour beers themselves change over time. They're constantly evolving even in the bottle. Other than a couple commercial examples that have been pasteurized, your majority of sour beers are going to be changing every couple months to every few years that you keep them. So very much like a fine wine, they're going to change. Some may improve, some may wane. It really depends on the beer, so that's part of the fun of brewing sour beer. But it's also something to uh, keep in mind. So let's jump right in. A um, little bit of the history of the Lambic. Now, the Lambic was classically cooled in a cool ship. And if you don't know what that is, a cool ship is basically a very shallow vessel, um, maybe about an inch or two high and very wide. So the idea behind this is to allow evaporation to occur very quickly and to allow the beer to cool very quickly. What also happens with this is that the beer is going to be exposed to the outside ambient air and along with the air a lot of microbes that are going to be floating on the wind. So during this time they're going to build up a large amount of microbes uh, including some good bacteria and some bad bacteria as well as our friendly brewer's yeast and several other <laughs> very unusual things. So it can really be a very interesting mixed soup of cultures. Uh, this beer is generally served uh, flat or as a real ale would be with a very light level of carbonation. This is true for classic styles but as we'll talk about a little bit later um, our modern examples have changed a little bit in its uh, carbonation level. Now this beer is aged up to three years to really obtain its full level of complexity. In the very beginning, it may even be considered undrinkable up to the first year, and after that, slowly improve. But it's that time that really gives it that interesting flavor, complexity, and depth that we're looking for in this beer. Like I said, these beers are living things, so it's best to think about them as such. And as they continue to grow, they're going to evolve and change. Now, straight lambic, which is a single running um, and a single barrel in some case, um, is often blended into a goose. Now a goose is a blend of different lambics, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And a superior vintage of lambic, uh, much like champagne, 
will be bottled unblended and served as a special cuvee. Now if we look at our vital statistics for this beer, let's start out with our gravity readings. Now it's between 1040 and 1054 and a final gravity of 1001 and 1010. So what this tells us is that this beer is generally going to be reasonably lower in alcohol, um, if not session strength than around the 5% average alcohol range. And judging by the final gravity, it's usually perceived as very dry. IBU level between 0 to 10 is incredibly low, so don't expect too much bitterness in this. It's usually just enough hops to balance the microbial load and keep it in check. SRM is between 3 and 7, so again, very light color. Uh, and our ABV, like we were talking about before, is 5 to 6.5 percent. Now, carbonation is an interesting point. Classically, this is sort of flat uh, due to the extended aging process. But in more modern examples, we see it being carbonated up to 3 to 4.5 volume CO2. Now, the microbes involved in the lambic is, like I mentioned before, a microbial soup. So we have our basic saccharomyces, but along with that we have lactobacillus, Britannomyces, pediococcus, acetobacter, all of which we'll talk about in the next lecture coming up on microbes. But just take this in stride that it is quite a microbial mix. Our grain bill for this is going to be a mixture of pilsner and unmalted wheat in various ratios. 70-30 uh, ratio is very common, but again, it's really up to the discretion of the brewer uh, in order to find out whatever mixture they think will be the most beneficial for their beer and what they want it to become. Now when we look at hops for this, uh, this is going to be a common theme. Uh, generally, the noble hop varieties are going to be noted with low alpha acids and Generally very nice, mellow flavor, nothing too extraordinary going out there. And again, these are used in Lambic mostly for bitterness, uh, if not entirely for bitterness. Many Lambics aren't actually served just straight or even blended into the goose. A very large number are actually blended with fruit in order to add a little bit of complexity and possibly even balance out the beer. Uh, the unblended lambic may be deficient in some areas, such as acidity, or it may be too powerful in areas such as funky flavors and overly complex, if you can imagine it. So it's blended with several different fruits, uh, sour cherries, raspberries being very classic, but in more current times, we're seeing peach, blackcurrant, grape, and even strawberry included in this mix. So the fruit can add a extra level of complexity to the beer and also can round out some of the flavors which may not have been perfect in the lambic. So next we're going to look at goose. Goose is a blend of one, two, and three-year-old lambic. The young lambic in this is going to contribute fermentable sugars and viable yeast for carbonating the bottle, while the old Lambic has the complexity and more interesting varied aromas, uh, which, like we mentioned before, with being uh, overly complex, can be a little bit overpowering when they're not diluted. The high level of carbonation lends its own benefit uh, in that it can increase uh, the more nuanced flavors, adds a perception of dryness, and even increases perceptions of acidity and tartness. Now this beer is generally aged before it is uh, bottled and served uh, for the purposes of re-fermentation. Because you have to remember that that younger Lambic is still going to have fermentable sugars that still need to be completed. And that's going to give it that very large punch of carbon dioxide but we also have to make sure that it is settled uh, before we can actually serve this. Now the traditional goose comes from breweries around the Seine Valley in Belgium. So looking at some statistics for this beer, you'll note that it's very similar to the Lambic uh, like we saw before. 1040 for, to 1060 for original gravity, uh, 1000 to 1006, again a little bit drier than our Lambic before. I've used in a similar range, SRM, similar range. Um, ABV can go up to a little bit higher for this one. Again, carbonation for this one in both historic examples and modern examples uh, is between the 3.0 and 4.5 volumes of CO2. 
We look at this, our microbial level is the same as we saw in the lambic, because again, this is just a blended lambic, and our grain bill is going to be the same, since again, this is just a blended version. Hops, again, identical. So now we're going to talk a little bit about somewhat of a battle that's been going on, maybe more of a friendly competition, and that's the east side versus the west side, and the Flanders red versus the Flanders brown ales. So we'll start out talking about Flanders red. So now the Flanders Red is native to the west of Flanders. And this beer is uh, generally aged in wooden barrels. And now the porous nature of that wood is going to lead to more complex sours compared to Flanders Brown Ales. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we discuss aging vessels. But generally speaking, the porous nature of the wood allows a very small level of oxygen to enter over time, which is going to play a role in changing the acids that we're going to perceive from these beers. And the wood itself is going to possibly lend a few more microbes than we would see in a stainless steel or glass tank. Now these beers are generally very crisp and have very high levels of attenuation. And in historic examples, they're going to be blended, but again, this practice of blending has becoming a bit more rare today. If we look at the statistics of this beer, again, we have a 1048 to 1057 original gravity. Found a gravity of between uh, 1002 and 1012, so possibly a little bit on the sweeter side compared to a Lambic, but again, still a very dry beer. IBUs are going to be a bit higher, and they're creeping up a little bit more, with a 10 to 25 IBU range. SRM, again, is going to be a bit darker in that 10 to 16 range, that beautiful sort of sweet spot where we see our uh, Irish reds and our Flanders reds. It's the special place with uh, the grain bill that you can get just perfect to make that really bright red hue. ABV on this is going to be between 4.6 and 6.5% ABV. Carbonation is going to be a little bit lower than we saw in the Lambic and Goose. It's going to be between 1.9 and 2.5 volumes of CO2. The microbes that we're going to use in this beer include Saccharomyces, Lactobacillus, Britannomyces, Pediococcus, and Acetobacter. So again, like we saw before in the Lambic style and goose, we have a bit of a microbial soup. It's everything in the kitchen sink with this. So again, high level of complexity. Our grain bill for this is going to have a base of Vienna or Munich malt, although in some cases Pilsner is used. And small levels of special B and maize are used for color adjustment and body adjustment, respectively. The Special B is going to lend a little bit of darkness, while the Maze can round out the body and dry it out a little bit. Hops, we're going to use Noble Hop varieties that are low in alpha acids. Now we're going to talk about Eau de Brune. This is from the east side of Flanders. And this one is fermented in stainless steel tanks. And this actually began in the 1970s. Before this, they both Eau de Brune and Flanders Red were both aged in uh, oak barrels, but it wasn't until the 1970s that this practice began and we started to see more of a schism between these two beer styles. Now, the stainless steel does change the beer a bit. It leads to a more clean lactic sourness. So, again, like we spoke about before, the porous nature of the wood leads to more oxygen exposure, which leads to different types of acids. The stainless steel being reasonably impermeable to oxygen is going to prevent this. Also stainless steel is going to be very easy to clean so less chance of any infection from any outside source getting in. So unlike a barrel which is going to have the wood which is nigh on impossible to clean thoroughly, stainless steel can achieve that level. So historically this was considered a provision beer and when it was first put out, it wouldn't be sour, but it naturally gained sourness as it aged. Now, compared to the red ales, they do contain a bit more bitterness, but this is balanced, 
on the other end by a bit more malty sweetness, leading to a overall balanced beer, but one which has a little bit more of that bitter bite. Now, if we look at our statistics for this one, uh, we have a original gravity between 1040 and 1074, final gravity between uh, 1008 and 1012, so again, a little bit more round, a little bit more sweet, I would say. IBU range between 20 and 25, so reasonably substantial IBUs. Our SRM is going to be between 15 and 22, our ABV between 4 and 8%, and our carbonation, again, similar to the Flanders Red, is going to be between 1.9 and 2.5 volumes of CO2. Now, the microbes for this are going to be a bit more selective. We have the Saccharomyces, Lactobacillus, and Pediococcus. Not quite as much with our Britannomyces and Acetobacter with this beer. For our grain bill, we have a base of Pilsner's malt. And on top of this, we have dark caramel malts with a small, very small portion of uh, black and roasted malts, mostly for color adjustment. Additionally, like the Flanders Red, corn adjuncts are very common. Now, this beer is going to be brewed with the Noble Hot varieties that are low in alpha acid. So if we look at a quick comparison between these two beer styles, just as a really quick recap of those two. Uh, Flanders Red brewed in the west, while Flanders Brown is brewed in the east. Red has a bit of a lighter color, while brown is a bit darker. Red generally has a Vienna or Munich base malt, while brown has the Pilsner base malt. The red is going to be aged in oak barrels, while the brown is going to be aged in stainless steel. And the reds are going to exhibit more acetic and lactic sourness, while the brown ales are going to have more prominent lactic sourness. Next we'll look at the Linderweiss, which is personally one of my favorite sour beer styles. The style is actually a wheat beer, which was originally brewed in Berlin, Germany. It's believed to have started around 1572, but a firm date on this isn't quite solidified yet. Um, it's dubbed a Schank beer, which means a low alcohol draft beer. Now, it's kind of unusual because this beer, due to its high level of carbonation, is almost never served on draft. Uh, Schank beer, though, literally means tap or draft. Um, and Berliner Weiss is actually one of very few beers that fall in that category. Um, the alcohol range of these is between uh, about 0 0.5 and 2.6, which Berliner Weiss falls into perfectly. So once upon a time, it was uh, dubbed the Champagne of the North by Napoleon and his troops. Um, however, more down-to-earth Berliners call this the Worker's Sparkling Wine, which I personally believe because it makes an excellent substitute for a Prosecco and can be very nicely served in a champagne flute. Now, the Berliner Weiss is traditionally served with woodruff or raspberry syrup to cut down on the acidity. This term, mit Schuss, which literally means with a shot. Now, in historic examples, the Berliner Weiss was actually unboiled, and the sourness came from the lactobacillus native to the grain. In more modern examples, we see a full boil for this beer. One thing to note about this beer when you're considering brewing it is that Berlin has hard water, which is going to lead to higher perceived acidity. So it might be very advantageous for the brewer to make their water a bit harder to replicate that style, and then in turn have more acidity be perceived in their beer. Now, as you see in this picture, uh, the Berliner Weiss is normally served in a bowl shape or goblet glass. So again, we have a picture here, two different styles. Uh, Berliner Weiss on the left is uh, with the Woodruff syrup, and on the right is with raspberry syrup. Some quick statistics on this. Uh, the original gravity is between uh, 1028 and 1032, and final gravity is between 10.03 and 10.06. So again, this is going to be a very light beer and a beer that's reasonably dry. The IBUs are between 3 and 8. Again, used primarily for the purpose of inhibiting 
overbearing microbial load and balancing. The SRM of this beer is between two and three, so very, very light beer. The ABV is between 2.8 and 3.8, and the carbonation is generally very high in the 3.5 volume CO2 range. The two main microbes in this are lactobacillus and saccharomyces. With this beer, you don't want any vinegary sourness. You don't want too much funk, although in some historic examples, it was said that funk was a part of the beer and Britannomyces was part of it. In more modern examples, it's mainly the lactobacillus and saccharomyces running the show. That being said, it could be a lot of fun to make a beer with Britannomyces. The grain bill on this is generally 60 to 70% wheat, with the remaining being a Pilsner-based malt. And the hops, again, recurring theme here, noble hop varieties, low in alpha acids. Next style, we have a Goza, and that's pronounced Gosa, G-O-S apostrophe A, Gosa. This beer is a historic German white beer. And the style is actually believed to be over a thousand years old. But again, like most of the history in beer, there's some level of debate in this. It's very strongly associated with the city of Leipzig, which is the capital of Saxony. And it's actually named after the River Gosse, which is located in the lower part of Saxony. So this beer is classically brewed with an addition of salt and coriander. And originally, the water was just very high in salinity. But again, if you're brewing it today, the water that you would use, you would dose with a level of salt. The statistics on this beer, we have an original gravity of 1036 to 1056, so a little bit stronger, uh, reasonably average alcohol range. Found gravity of between 1006 and 1010, IBU range of 5 to 12, an SRM range of 3 to 4, ABV of 4.2 to 4.8 percent, and carbonation of approximately 3.0 volume CO2. Again, the two main microbes in this, much like the Berliner Weiss, are Lactobacillus and Saccharomyces. Our grain bill is going to be 40 percent uh, barley and 60% wheat. Once again, low alpha noble hops are generally used. So the next style that I don't want to touch too much into because I truly believe that this has been plumbed by a lot of other authors um, are American Wild Ales. So the person you see in this picture is Machiel Tonsmeyer who wrote American Sour Beers, an excellent book for anyone who would like more information on brewing sour beers. But just to give you a quick overview, it's really a very diverse category of beer spanning many broad ranges of styles and flavors. First main category is Britannomyces beer. Um, it's going to be a base style, generally one of the many approved bases, uh, brewed with either 100% Britannomyces or a culture which contains Britannomyces. Next is mixed fermentation sour, and that's going to be any non-sour base which has a wild or funky character added to it through the addition of whatever microbes that the brewer wishes to add. The final one is going to be wild specialty beers, which is a fruit, herb, or vegetable beer brewed with a sour or funky character, or a sour beer aged on wood. Again, this is a hugely broad range. Uh, it's almost anything that you can imagine. It's the Willy Wonka factory of sour beers. If you can imagine it, they can create it. And you can create it too. So this leads a lot to the imagination. This is almost like the playground for sour brewers. Now I'd just like to talk a little bit about some rare and unusual sour beer styles that you may not have come across uh, before. But it's an interesting thing to see. and It's always fun to resurrect these old beers. So first we have the Lichtenhainer, which is, in my opinion, a cross between a Berliner Weiss and a Grazer, which is a uh, Polish wheat smoked beer, or Polish smoked wheat beer. Uh, it's a sour, smoky beer that is fermented with ale yeast. 
bitterness was moderate and the alcohol level was moderate to reasonably sessionable. The next one is historic porter. So classically, porter was really somewhat of a sour creation. Uh, it's reported that the best beers were produced at the bar with mixtures of old stale, basically beer that had gone sour, porter, and young fresh porter. So it was the combination of the two, much as we see in a lot of sour beers with blending, young with the old, that created a product that everyone enjoyed very much. Next we have farro, which is a lambic dosed with sugar. Um, these sugars include uh, caramel, brown sugar, and molasses. And the lambic was generally a bit darker due to the coloring that was imparted by the sugars. Now the Kentucky Common, and this is kind of a maybe. So the Kentucky Common is a very historic example. Um, it co was composed of a grist of about 60% two row, 35 to 38% corn, a little bit of black malt, a little bit of caramel malt. Uh, it had a classic cereal mash and a main mash at a very high temperature. It was a bitter beer, but it wasn't too hoppy. Uh, rumor was that a sour mash was employed, much as we see in a lot of the Kentucky bourbons. Uh, unfortunately, this rumor isn't uh, at all true, but again, it's also reported that some of these beers might have been a bit sour, but that might not have actually been a desired characteristic. It's possible that the lactobacillus actually came from the barrels that it was aged in and not the mash. So again, it was possible that some examples of the style were sour, but not necessarily an attribute that was really desired in the beer. This being said, there's no reason why one could not recreate this beer in how they would like to imagine the style of being a sour mash and produce that. I just wouldn't enter this into any competitions if you decide to sour it. Now, the last one that we're going to talk about is a Mars or a Mertz. This was one that I had never come across before, so I found it to be very interesting. It is a weaker beer made from the second or third runnings of Alambic, and generally in the range of about 2 to 3% alcohol. Cool thing about this, I believe, is that it could be either served on its own, or it could be used to dilute Alambic for a blend. So first, I'd like to thank my image sources. And I would very much like to thank the references that I used through this presentation. Thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. If you'd like to see the rest of our sour beer brewing series, please go to www.fermentationeducation.com.